Hi, I'm Mitchell Walker, and when I'm not teaching people how to find hidden money, I'm out stacking Benjamins. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and today we're talking about Vulcans. Wow, a Star Trek episode. How awesome is that? Hey, guys, when did we become that cool? Oh, it's it's not Vulcan. It's, oh, oh, Volcano. Okay, all right. Hey, even cooler. Joining us today is senior researcher and volcanologist. You can understand my mistake, right? Volcanologist Rosalie Lopez. Plus, in our headline segment, one exchange is putting the kibosh on alcohol while trading. Never knew that was a thing. And economists prove again just how hard it is to know what's going on with interest rates. We'll also throw out the Haven Lifeline to a lucky listener named Mike who's wondering about exchange-traded funds and still leave time for my very own volcano-themed trivia. And now, two guys who are sitting here ready to erupt. Joe and O j j j j g I think it's half the reason people listen to the show. It's just to see which one of us is going to erupt next. Maybe. That has a little bit to do with it. Maybe. Hey, there, everybody. Welcome to Volcanoes for the Win podcast. I'm Joe Selsey. I average Joe Money on Twitter and across the card table from me today, kicking off our Monday, it is Mr. OG. What is shaking? I just got home from Seattle. Ooh, very cool. It's fantastic. Beautiful this time of year. It is. We hiked around Mount Rainier. We also hiked around the, uh, what's the other one? The Olympics, the Olympic did, mountain range. Did you go up Mount Rainier at all? No, just around the base. I really don't have any, does, I'd like to go to the base camp. That would be kind of cool. Uh-huh. But um, no, no, we didn't do that. Okay. So just a leisurely walk? Just a leisurely walk in the woods, which was absolutely beautiful. This one was very quiet. So no Seattle meetup this time. And as you and I both know, we love our Seattle meetups. Seattle comes out for us and we have a ton of fun with you guys. But this was just a quiet trip. And you had to fly in incognito so that nobody at the airport recognized you. I, so that they wouldn't assume that there was some sort of uh, party at Elysian. That's right. I had to. I wore sunglasses. <laughs> the big nose with the mustaches underneath them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, nobody nobody wondered who I was except the guy at the TSA. And the weird thing was, he was intensely interested in who I really was. Yeah, sir, please take off the ski mask. No, you're not allowed to take nunchucks. <laughs> he said, uh, sir, you don't need nunchucks, but you could use a boost. And I'm like, oh, yes, I could. Are you familiar with Experian Boost? And then I proceeded to tell him, thanks to Experian Boost for supporting Stacking Benjamins, Experian Boost could potentially help you establish or increase your access to credit, Mr. TSA. Boost your FICO score instantly for free. Then I told him Boost is only available at Experian.com slash SB. You know what he said then? Sir, keep moving. He did. He did, which was which I thought was very impolite because I just potentially helped that guy increase his credit score by a ton. But whatever. Hey, we got a great show, though, OG. We've got Rosalie Lopez, Dr. Rosalie Lopez here. We're going to talk volcanoes. What do volcanoes have to do with you and the way that you make money and maybe your retirement? We're going to talk about all that and more. But first, we got some fun headlines today. So let's move. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamins headlines. First headline is super fun, avoiding scams. This uh, comes to us from money.com. Scammers are targeting people with medical bills. Here are seven red flags to look out for. And you know what? It's been a while since we've covered these OG. So I thought it's a good time to go back, you know, dust these off and say, how do I make sure that I'm not at the end of some phishing scheme? This is written by Barry Bridges. Barry writes, when you're dealing with medical bills not covered by your insurance or car repairs not covered by your warranty, sometimes a personal loan has you covered. You can even use a personal loan for a non-emergency such as a home improvement project. However, 
You should always be on the lookout for fraudulent lenders. Personal loan scams specialize in taking advantage of situations where people need money and then they take their unfortunate customers for a ride. The good news is that loan scams raise a number of unmistakable red flags. Here's what you need to know to recognize the fakes and frauds from a mile away. You ready? Seven signs a lender may be a scammer. Number one, the lender isn't interested in your payment history. And I don't think we, I don't think we need to uh, review this too much. But if it's a loan from anybody, like, dude, we got gotcha, you. Doesn't mean they're a scammer, but that's a pretty big red flag. Even in the uh, Gambler movie with Mark Wahlberg, he asked him if he's ever taken out a loan this big and if he's good for it. That's right. It says reputable lenders make it clear they'll need to look at your credit, sometimes getting reports from all three major credit bureaus. They need to know whether you have a history of paying your bills on time. And to your point, if they're asking Mark Wahlberg, they're going to ask you. Mm -hmm. Number two, the lender isn't registered in your state. That's a good idea. Just look up the lender. Do a do a quick Google search and see if they're registered in your state. They're not, and you're being offered a loan. Yeah, skip. Number three, the lender demands a prepaid debit card. If they demand prepaid anything, you might be being taken. Yeah, there's a time and a place for like secured credit card route, which is uh, quite often used when when your credit's really bad or you're just getting started. You put money on deposit and then you use your own money basically as a credit card and then you pay yourself back, but it's the bank and then they report you as a on-time payer and it helps build your credit history a little bit. But yeah, if they say, well, we'll give you 10000 you're just going to have to cut us a check for two of it back right away. Uh, and put it on a prepaid debit card, which by the way, yeah, or that, <laughs> and that. You go down to the grocery store and you get the prepaid debit card to put the 2000 on. That's like handing them cash cash. Yep. It, it's almost completely untraceable. You can't get the money back. It's it's gone. Number four, the lender calls, writes, or knocks. I've made it a point. Just if anybody ever calls me about anything versus it being at the end of a long line of research that I did, I don't accept. Yeah. I think it's funny how we've transitioned from calling is now worse than emailing. It used to be, well, unless they call you, you got to stay away from the email scams. And now you're like, oh, there's so many junk calls. I just don't even answer my phone. Well, you know, and it used to be, and this is sad, there used to even be, from time to time, I could tell the person, no, thank you. There's not even a person at the end of these. Right. There's some machine. Number five, the lender's website isn't secure. Remember, there's the little S on the end of your HTTP. Mm -hmm. look, look for that. Number six, the lender has no physical address. That's probably a guy in a tent in our backyard and he wonders if we if we need some money. If we need some money. <laughs> it's like the ice cream truck driving down the street. No, Cheryl. He said his name's Larry. I'm not really sure where he's from. He's got some hedge fund money that he's willing to part with. He's just trying to figure out good people to lend it to. He's just a prince, like literally a prince from Africa. And he's got this big inheritance and he wants to wants to lend it to me. Number seven, the lender pressures you to act immediately. Once again, anybody pressures you to act right now. I think that's also a tough one. Those are just good and uh, a good short reminder about avoiding scams. If it feels like a scam, it probably is a scam. Amen, brother. Our second headline uh, you sent to me this morning comes to us from the Cato Institute macroeconomic forecasting seems pretty hopeless. The yield, this is written by Chris Edwards, the yield on 10-year treasury securities is currently 2.1%. Now look at a chart for the Wall Street Journal showing expert predictions about what the current rate would be. The journal reports, not a single respondent in January's Wall Street Journal survey of economists predicted the yield on the 10-year treasury note would fall below 2.5% this year. In October, when yields on the 10-year treasury were near their peak of around 3.2%, None of the more than 50 respondents in the Wall Street Journal's monthly survey of economists predicted yields would dip below 2.75% by June 2019. The average forecast was 3.39. Forecast of interest rates appear pretty awful. And this is a market where vast profits are at stake, so there are big incentives to get it right. I've noted that economists are also lousy at predicting economic growth. 
What are the policy implications? The economy is too complex and uncertain for even the best economists to predict. So politicians stand no chance. It seems <laughs> unlikely that political schemes from Washington to manage and manipulate our future economy would work. Furthermore, while businesses are forced to eat humble pie and change direction when the economy changes, the government's a rigid institution led by people who never admit their mistakes. So when politicians move economic resources around, the resources often get stuck in low value uses for years on end. So very true, my friend. I just think it's interesting that just another example of the market figures out a way to disappoint the greatest number of people. And in this case, disappointing people that we point to as some of the smartest among us. The smartest people, right, exactly. And this is true for, in this case, interest rates. It's true for stock prices. It's true for asset allocations, asset classes, you know, the over-under performance. We've talked recently about betting on the S&P 500 means you're just betting on a sector of the economy. You're saying the U.S. is going to continue in this streak for the next period of time. And it very well may, or it may not. But there's nobody among us that knows the answer to this. And this is just another quick example of diversification really matters. You know, there's a few things that move macroeconomics, and one of them are events that come up. And you have no idea what events are going to come up next. I mean, you look at the attacks now on oil tankers. Like You couldn't have predicted that a year ago. There was yeah. there was no way you were going to predict that, which also means that and this is, you know, getting a little off the reservation, OG, about what you're talking about. But it's why making sector bets, deciding to bet on a certain sector of the market versus having a wide diversified approach is so difficult. Yeah. And to take your point just a half a step further, there's been these attacks recently in the Gulf on oil tankers. And that could mean a whole bunch of different things, right? There's a lot of different paths that could come out of that, but none of us know which path will happen. And more importantly, not only do we not know what path will happen, we also don't know the economic stock market responses to those paths. There's there's so many layers of decisions right. that are ab above our pay grade, so to speak, that there's no way that anybody can accurately predict it. And if it is, and if you end up being right, if you say, well, I think this is going to happen, that's going to lead to this issue in the market. And then this is going to happen with my stock portfolio. You might get it right. That's just dart at dartboard stuff. You just happen to throw the right dart. It's not because, you know, you've got some fancy way to get it done. So, yeah, I mean, we look at the results of elections. How many times have we seen that where the market bets on an election or people bet on an election and the market goes a completely different way? Right. I mean, uh, betting on any of this stuff is so, so, so difficult, especially when you're not a full-timer. And then you read something like this with people who are full-timers. All they do. Yeah, yeah. All they do. And they weren't even in the ballpark. I mean, that's, that's amazing. We have a rare third headline here, OG. And I thought this one was really important to bring to people's attention. Apparently mine was so moving that you decided to make sure we had a third one just to offset the the lousy one well, that I brought to the table. <laughs> not at all. I actually thought yours was the important one. I mean, oh, I just thought that the one on scams was pretty quick. And we actually have a couple minutes here. Yeah, God forbid we have a podcast that's under 80 minutes, right? Yeah, yeah, we can't do that. Actually, let's end it on this note. This comes to us from CNN Business, written by Rob Pachetta. London Metals Exchange. Sorry, guys. It's banned traders from drinking. That is insane. The London Metal Exchange has banned dealers from trading while under the influence of alcohol in an attempt to overhaul the workplace culture at the Metal Center. Workers will be prohibited from drinking alcohol before doing business on the exchange's ring, Europe's last remaining open outcry trading floor, ensuring sobriety as they set global metal prices. Now we know why now we know why metal prices move in such weird ways. <laughs> That's why they're so weird. It's because everybody's been boozing it since 9 a.m. These people are on the floor yelling at each other, just hammered. It's amazing. It's like this podcast sometimes. Yeah. Luckily, we show up to this sober. That's a good thing. Does coffee count? If we, we do come significantly caffeinated, though. Good point. Most times. I think our takeaways here are uh, make your trade sober. I think that's a good move. Mm -hmm. Our second one is don't try to guess on macroeconomic trends. Not going to win. And uh, third, if Larry, who's walking door to door through your neighborhood, wants to offer you 10 grand, could be a scam.
Oh, gee, I have to tell you how I found this guest because I'm super excited she's here. She's going to talk not only about her amazing career as a volcanologist, which, by the way, you immediately put your fingers up because you thought she studies Star Trek. Is that not it? That is not. She studies volcanoes. Oh, they're hot. If you look up Dr. Rosalie Lopez, what you're going to find is photos of her next to active volcanoes going off something green screen I don't, something i don't think i'd ever do green screen in this case i don't think so it would be if it were me does she have one of those cool like tinfoil suits on she does not but she definitely has a hard hat on oh well that's way more badass than i would she be is. like oh yeah it's a million degrees of magma back there but uh yeah i just got a hard hat it'll be all right it won't melt to my head i found her though because we've done uh, quite a bit of work with tiaa a nonprofit financial company built, by the way, by Andrew Carnegie over 100 years ago to make sure that teachers weren't destitute. And during my course of discussions with people at TIAA, I found out that she speaks on behalf of them sometimes because of the fact that this person who is super smart, who's incredibly smart, we're going to talk about her career today. She uses annuities inside of her retirement plan. And when we talk about smart people on the internet all the time, using all kinds of different investments, using an annuity was something that piqued my interest because we we don't hear that often, OG, from people. So I wanted to to get it from the horse's mouth. So I asked if we could talk to her. Yeah, usually not on purpose. You don't hear it. (laughs) Right, right. A lot of annuities being sold. This is somebody that specifically requested annuities and uh, actually did a very fine job setting up her retirement plan. We're going to talk about her career, talk about studying volcanoes. We're going to talk about a non-traditional retirement. Dr. Rosalie Lopez coming down to the basement. And Dr. Rosalie Lopez joins us on my dad shortwave. I'm so happy you could spend some time with us. How are you? Good. It's, I'm glad to spend time with you, too. Well, how did you get started with volcanoes? I think it's so it's so incredible when somebody has a career path like yours has been. Did you do that third grade volcano art project, Rosalie, and decide, you know what, this is for me? No, actually, I started out by wanting to be an astronaut. Then I decided to study astronomy. And when I was studying astronomy, uh, in fact, in London, England, in my final year, I took a course on the geology of the planet. My professor was a volcanologist. Well, one day he didn't come to class and he sent a substitute who said, well, Mount Etna, this volcano in Sicily erupted and the professor had to go. And I thought that was really exciting. (laughs) So uh, I also really enjoyed the course and started talking to him and ended up doing my PhD with him. And that's how I'm here. Well, there are photos of you. As I was researching, one of the first things anybody sees when they look you up are many photos of you on the lip of an active volcano or (laughs) very close to lava. Have, Have you had any close calls during your career? Yes, I'm pretty cautious, and um, so I don't do really what I would consider stupid stuff. But if you know volcanoes, I mean, if you know the particular pattern of volcanic eruptions, you can take some risk. It's all about calculated risk. So I don't tend to work on very explosive volcanoes, and volcanoes that have small explosions like in Hawaii or Mount Etna in Sicily or Stromboli in Italy, then you can pretty much get out of the range of the bombs. And um, I have done a lot of work with lava flows and lava lakes. And, um, you know, of course, the lava lakes, you have to not go down into them, but you make your measurements from the edge. And lava flows, you'd be surprised, but you can even walk over them while they are still hot, if you know what you're doing. Holy cow. I would bring some marshmallows. I don't, I don't know. What, <laughs> is there more trouble to come in, in Hawaii? What's going on there currently? Well, at the moment, it's pretty quiet in Hawaii. Hawaii is actually a very mild volcano. Kilauea is a very mild volcano compared to many others around the world. So, yes, the lava can destroy property, but lava moves 
relatively slowly. You can get out of the way. You can drive out of the way. So it's more of, um, I would say, a nuisance than because it, it destroys property than a real danger. Mount St. Helens that erupted in 1980 here in the west coast of the U.S., that's really pretty dangerous. That's the dangerous type of volcano is when they are very explosive. Are those a surprise, a thing like Mount St. Helens, or does someone with your background, can you kind of see that coming ahead of time? Actually, all these volcanoes are very well monitored, and volcanoes don't just go bang in the night. They give warning signs. So, in fact, the volcanologists who were working there at the time knew that Mount St. Helens was going to erupt, and they had evacuated a large area. What they didn't know was that the eruption was going to end up blowing sideways rather than up. So they didn't evacuate a large enough area on the side of the mountain that blew out. And there were some other people who got killed because they were in the danger zone, hoping to take photographs or whatever. You know, these days might even be more people because, you know, people might be rushing in to take selfies. <laughs> right, right. And that's, yeah, yeah. I won't even get into that. That's all. But the, I know just enough to be dangerous, Dr. Lopez. But my understanding is uh, the area around Yellowstone is all volcanic activity. Is that something that we should be worried about at all? Well, we monitor it. And uh, Yellowstone a long time ago, and you know, we're talking millions of years ago, and the last significant eruption was 600,000 years ago or thereabouts. Yellowstone is the largest volcanic caldera on Earth. So it certainly has had gigantic eruptions in the past. It doesn't mean that it's going to have one, you know, anytime in the near future. In fact, a lot of the magma chamber is now pretty solidified. So there are a lot of geysers and geothermal activity, but it doesn't mean that it's going to erupt again. And if it does, it doesn't mean that it's going to be one of those catastrophic eruptions that happened a long time ago. I mean, it, it's still a possibility, so it's still monitored very carefully. You know, scientists there uh, look for um, signs that seismic activity has changed or the ground is inflating or um, you know, there are a number of possible precursors. So the important thing with volcanoes is to monitor them well and to study them well and to know in advance if something dangerous might be close to happening. Of course, we can't predict it 100%, but we can really tell when a, a volcano is misbehaving. <laughs> I have one more question about volcanoes before I want to talk a little bit and ask you some questions about your career, which I find so fascinating. You've written and done a lot of work, not just on Earth, but also the entire solar system. I mean, you've written about Cassini, about Titan, about different planets and activity on those planets. Is there one planet or one moon that really fascinates you? Well, as a volcanologist, there is one. It's called Io. It's a moon of Jupiter that is the most volcanically active body in the solar system. And Io has lavas similar to Earth, similar to what we see in Hawaii these days, but perhaps more primitive. Uh, we are not quite sure yet. Perhaps lavas similar to those that erupted on Earth millions to billions of years ago. And Io has this gigantic lava flows, and they are active, and plumes erupting into space. So for a volcanologist, really like paradise. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm also very fascinated by a moon of Saturn called Titan. Titan's eruptions, we haven't detected any, but we think it had eruptions in the past. But those are very different type of eruptions because Titan is a very cold moon. There is a crust of ice. And underneath that, there is a notion of liquid water. So the volcanism is when that liquid water actually comes up to the surface in a way that's a bit like slushy ice. So we call that cryovolcanism because it's, it's called volcanism. So it's the same process as something coming from the interior to the surface, but is actually a different material. It's not molten rock, it's uh, water. And 
the reason that Titan is so fascinating is this ocean could actually have life. And in fact, that's one of my projects at the moment is to study the habitability of Titan. You know, if Titan has heat in its interior, it has an ocean of liquid water under its surface crust. And Titan has a lot of organic material on the surface and the atmosphere. So those are some of the ingredients that you need for life. And it's considered one of the best places in the solar system for us to look for life in the future. Well, Ed, you kind of guessed my next question because I want to get a little science fiction for maybe half a second. You and I both have seen all of this talk in the last few weeks about the Navy and these UFO sightings, this dramatic stuff. Where do you stand on life outside of Earth? Well, there is. Uh, the possibility of life outside Earth. But if you're talking about UFOs, you're talking about intelligent life. And then that's kind of completely different. That's not something that I would study or research at all. Sure. You know, what the scientists are researching more is the possibility of microbial life, that life actually developed somewhere else than Earth. One more follow-up on that. Do you get into the science fiction aspect of all that just on a personal level? Well, not very much, actually. I used to read science fiction a lot more when I was a a kid and a teenager, and I still enjoy some science fiction movies. But uh, these days, I'm not so much into (laughs) science fiction. You know, I'm I'm much more into science fact. (laughs) Well, and and on that note, I want to go back into your career for just a moment because it's such a fascinating career. As you know, it's not a field that many people are in. I would bet that you know most everyone that does what you do. Everyone has a point in their career, though, that they point to as a big break or something that they did right. Where would you say for you those inflection points in your career have been, if you could point to maybe one or two that were really helpful and might help somebody young wanting to do something like what you are doing? As I mentioned before, I did my degree in England and uh, my PhD as well. I'm originally from Brazil, so the first big break, which I'm very thankful that my parents fully supported it, was to allow me to go to England by myself at 18 years old. Uh, We didn't have cell phones in those days or email, and let me study there. After my PhD, I was looking for a position, and the um, opportunities for research in the UK were very, very limited at that time. I had lived in England 13 years. I actually started working there at the Greenwich Observatory, but I really wanted to work in the United States and and have a chance to uh, work with data that NASA had acquired. And um, so I made a break to come and take what's called a postdoctoral position in the United States and that was only a two-year position, so I, I took a risk that I would uh, you know, make it here, and I did. So I think my message to young people is that sometimes you've got to be courageous, and you have to move city, you have to move country, and if you really have that passion, you have to go where that passion takes you. That's a fantastic message, and thanks for sharing it. This show, ostensibly, is about money and about finance. And for some people, it's about building this retirement fund, doing something that you love as much as you clearly love what you do. Do you ever think about the concept of retirement for for you personally? Yes, I do. Not because I want to stop working or doing what I do, but I want to have options. And I think that that's something that, you know, I see a lot of my colleagues, again, they want to have options. They want to maybe, you know, focus more on research, you know, less on teaching or doing other things that they, you know, we all have to do for our jobs. So I do focus on retirement. I'm not saying that I would ever want to completely stop what I'm doing, but I I want to have the option to have more freedom. And you've been fairly vocal about the fact that you've been using annuities as one vehicle to reach your retirement vision. And that's something, you know, when a lot of people hear an annuity, they go, oh, I don't know a lot about that. Why did you choose annuities? Well, because I wanted a balanced portfolio and I didn't want everything to be very risky. Actually, it's funny that personally, I have taken a lot of risk. I have 
change country twice, start a new life. You know, I take risks when I go to volcanoes, but with my finances, I have always been somewhat conservative. And um, with annuities, you have something guaranteed. So what I felt was that I wanted to have my basic expenses, my bread and butter, uh, you know, guaranteed, you know, and then you leave aside some money that you can invest in something that carries a greater risk and greater potential rewards as well. But I didn't want to do it all, you know, put all my eggs in one basket. Gotcha. I was very curious about that. Well, thank you so much for spending a few minutes with us and talking about volcanoes. What's your current project, by the way, that you're working on? Are you allowed to tell us anything about uh, that? I, oh, yes, yes, yes. We, uh, I don't do any secret work. Right. Um, uh, in fact, you know, scientists have to publish, you know, we publish or perish. So, uh, <laughs> you know, we always want to uh, tell other scientists and tell the world about what we are doing. And I'm studying the habitability of Titan, as I mentioned before. And I study particularly the geology of Titan. I am uh, finishing now uh, what we call a geologic map of the whole of this moon, figuring out what processes, geologic processes operated when, like, uh, you know, wind deposits and volcanism and mountain building. And, um, you know, but also working with colleagues who are, you know, even biologists to do experiments to see if microbes could actually survive in the conditions of Titan's deep ocean. So we will not be able to say whether Titan has life or not. We will just be able to constrain it and say perhaps that, yes, this organism could survive under those conditions. That is so fascinating. And that's a whole nother hours and hours podcast episode that I want to dive into, but I'm out of time. Dr. Lopez, thanks for taking right. a few minutes out of your busy schedule to hang out with us for a few minutes and talk volcanoes and retirement. All right. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Hey there, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. Wow. Wasn't Rosalie Lopez cool? In honor of her, I am super excited to announce that first, I'm going to build my own volcano over by the canned peaches. And B, I'm going to drop some volcano-themed trivia right here, right now. Check it. While Dr. Lopez told us that there are plenty of dormant volcanoes all over our solar system, Earth has its own fair share of volcanoes, too. What is the name of the largest volcano on Earth? I'll be right back with your answer right after this. OG, you know that the better your credit score, the easier it is to pay less for those big items you may need when you need to use credit to buy something. So the question is, why is it so hard to raise your score? Well, now it won't be thanks to Experian. They've launched Experian Boost, a brand new way to instantly increase your credit score for free. A higher credit score can help you establish and get access to credit and preferred rates for the things you need in life. Experience on a mission to help boost America's credit score, which will help millions of people across the country build and get better access to credit. People all across America have already raised their credit scores with Experian Boost, and you should too. So how does it work? Well, for the first time ever, paying your utilities and cell phone can instantly improve your credit score. Experian Boost works by giving you credit for the bills you're already paying through your bank account, like your water bill, your gas bill, your electric, your cable, your cell phone. So if you pay your bills through a checking or a savings account, you could instantly raise your credit score. It used to take months to see your credit score rise a point or two, but with Boost, you can increase your credit score instantly. Boost is free to use and only available from Experian. Only positive payments are factored into your credit file. It can only help. It can't hurt. Rare situations where your score goes down from boosting, you can instantly disconnect boost and your credit score will go back up to where it was. Experian Boost can potentially help you establish or increase your access to credit. Boost your FICO score instantly for free. Boost is only available at Experian.com slash SB. That's E-X-P-E-R-I-A-N dot com slash SB. Welcome back. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. Before the break, I asked you to name the largest volcano on Earth. The answer, 
No, it's not the fire burning inside OG's heart. Close, but if you said Mauna Loa, you'd be correct. Historically, anyway, just a few years ago, back in 2013, Tamu Massif was discovered underwater, and experts say that it is probably the largest volcano on Earth, but heavy emphasis on the probably. There's italics and underlines, all kinds of stuff. Anyway, so right now we're going with Mauna Loa, but if you said the uh, Tamu Massif, I'll also accept that answer, but uh, we'll leave the specifics to experts like Rosalie. That's it for today. See ya. Huge thanks again to Dr. Rosalie Lopez for hanging out with us. Do you think we could get her to send us a sample of some magma? Some lava? Magma. She's so cool, isn't she? You're like Dr. Evil. Magma. Do not stop with just our interview. Go online, look up Dr. Rosalie Lopez, follow our links on our show notes page, and listen to her talk. Watch her videos online. Fascinating fascinating work that she does if you're at all interested in science volcanoes any of that stuff but this is really cool og so i want to get to this point because i think rosalie is using annuities in the best way it's that lifetime income piece right like salespeople get all sexy about hey there's this feature that feature nope she stripped all that away she's using it for what the product was meant to be which is an income stream that you can't outlive. Well, that's what it's for. I was just having this conversation a couple of weeks ago. There are no such things as bad products. There's just bad applications of products. We talk about permanent insurance, like, oh, you should only have term insurance. Well, yeah, that works most of the time, 95% of the time, but there's times where it doesn't make sense. Annuities make sense for some people at some times, as long as you're using them in the right capacity. And when you, like you said, strip it all away, what do you have? You have a contract between you and a company that they will pay you a stream of income forever. And if that works to help solidify your financial plan or help build your financial plan, then it's a great tool. Yeah, I totally agree. But a lot of the bells and whistles that you'll find on these products, not always a fan of of all of those, but this very, very basic approach, just fascinating and Fantastic that she could talk to us about it. Hey, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline OG and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put what you value first. And in our Facebook group, our friend Colton said he values the DMV and multi-level marketing schemes. Nice. He has far more time for those things because he used Haven Life and didn't spend all day with his insurance. I mean, different people value different stuff. Haven Life, the script in front of me, Colton, says your loved ones and your time, but the DMV and multi-level marketing could be a winner as well. That's why they may buy quality term life insurance actually simple. Head to stackybedjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now to get a free quote. I say this every week, but it's a super simple application. The prices are very affordable and their policies are issued by a more than 160-year-old insurer, Mass Mutual. And today we're throwing out the lifeline to our friend Michael. Say hi, Michael. Hi, Joe and OG. This is Mike from Jacksonville, Florida. I'm planning on adding some small cap values to my Fidelity Roth IRA. I'm not crazy about any of their index funds for small cap value, but I do like their iShare small cap value. Is there any downside going with it? ETF instead of mutual funds in a Roth IRA. I probably won't learn anything, but I'm sure going to rock that (laughs) t-shirt. I bet you will, Mike. I bet you will. That's awesome. I like this. So first of all, let's talk about small cap value and what that would bring to a portfolio. We don't know exactly what Mike's thinking, OG, but when you talk about small cap value, what are you thinking? I'm thinking a large underperformer for the last decade relative to the overall markets and a great disappointment. (laughs) No, but in all seriousness, studies have shown that adding things like smaller companies or adding things like companies that have been around a little while to your portfolio or profitable companies to your portfolio add a good level of diversification and increase what we call the expected return of your portfolio. So if all you have is S&P 500 and then you complement it with, let's say, small cap or you complement it with real estate or real estate and small cap, you're going to actually reduce the overall ups and downs of the portfolio while keeping the return the same or maybe even increasing the return 
along with decreasing the uh, variability there. So uh, yeah, and that's, the diversifier. And, and, yeah, and I don't want to gloss over that. I want to stop there for just a second. You can actually add, what you're saying is you can add riskier asset classes to your portfolio and it will still tone down the risk of your portfolio because you're taking several different risks. Yep, that's the plan. Anyway, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, you did. And you did a successful job at it. So Ta -da! <laughs> I was on a roll. The uh, The question that he had, of course, was what's the difference between a mutual fund and ETF? And, you know, there's some intricate details on the inside that make them a little different in terms of its tradability and and that sort of thing. But but by and large, they operate very similarly to one another, whether you use a Fidelity small cap mutual fund or a BlackRock iShares ETF or a Vanguard mutual fund or ETF, they're going to operate very similarly to one another. The thing I would double check is I would make sure that the index fund that you're buying is representing the index that you expect it to represent. Because there's a little difference between the actual name of the fund and then what they're legally required to mimic. Just because they call it a small cap fund doesn't actually mean that it necessarily will be because there's no you know, that's the marketing people that are picking those names out to figure out what, you know, what's going to sell or resonate and that sort of thing. So I would just take just a second and, and, and kind of read the first little bit of the prospectus or like a cut sheet or something like that, just like a one pager fund description thing that says, you know, the fund is intended to mimic or replicate the results of the Russell 2000 value, da 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 da. And if that's what it says, something similar to that, boom, that's your winner. So not a profound difference between ETFs and mutual funds. Biggest difference is that the ETF is going to allow you to trade it throughout the day, which you're probably not going to want to do anyway. So, well, not one. unless he's drunk on the Lend of Metals Exchange. Well, there's that. Yeah, you could do that. I think the big reason he's writing is to make sure he's not stepping in it. I would say no, wouldn't you? Yeah. You'd say yes, he's not stepping in it. Yes, he's not stepping in it. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for the question, Mike. You got a question for the Haven Lifeline? Guess what? You can be like Mike. Mikey likes it. Remember that? Wasn't that Life Serial? It was, yep. And he was a weatherman in the area that I grew up in. Was he later in life? No, no, as a child. As a ch he was a child, <laughs> child star weatherman. Yeah. He was like uh, Be uh, Benjamin Button. He said, right, went backwards. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. That's the Haven Lifeline. And you too can rock the greatest money show on earth t-shirt like Mike's just about to when he gets the code from Gertrude. That's going to do it for today. By the way, thanks to everybody who's left a review of the show. We've gotten some uh, fantastic reviews lately, and we're entirely, we're incredibly grateful, not just for the reviews, we're incredibly grateful that anybody listens to us. OG and I have a lot of fun here making the show, and uh, I feel so lucky that we get to talk to people like Rosalie Lopez, but I also feel lucky that we get to kind of hang out with you while you're on your commute or your on your run or whatever you're doing. Glad you're with us today. Uh, mom's putting this one on the fridge. This review is from responsible pet owner. I, I love that. Love that name. Five stars. The show's a must listen. I feel almost as though I'm in a trance. I close my eyes and count backwards from three. And when I snap my fingers, I'm overcome with delight at the Stacky Benjamin show. 11 bonus points. If you catch the reference, it's such a great, great reference too. that makes me laugh every time. And by the way, we'll just let people figure it out. If you don't know what the reference is from. Thanks to responsible pet owner, mom laughed her head off and that's on the fridge. All right. That's going to do it for today, guys. Doug, you got it from here, man. What should we have learned today? Well, Joe, first take some advice from Rosalie Lopez and dive into your career. Who knows what can happen if you just say, that sounds fascinating. You too might find yourself exploring the landscape on Titan or Mars. Second, that firm that called you with a great loan offer. Do a little research online to make sure they're licensed in your state, that they have a physical office, and that they aren't asking for something like a prepaid debit card to get the job done. But the big lesson? Ask Joe's mom before you begin building a volcano over by the canned peaches. You know, not, not that I made a mess or anything. I wouldn't do that, but not here. Not, to, you know, right, right where we work and everything, but... Yeah, I got to go clean that up before she sees it. That doesn't even look like lava, but it sure smells like it. Oh, man. Special thanks to the folks at TIAA for hooking us up with Dr. Rosalie Lopez. We appreciate their help making this episode different 
and fun. Thanks also to Dr. Rosalie Lopez. Seriously, I know Joe said this earlier, but go look her up with a quick internet search if you have any interest at all in science. She's done some fascinating talks. We'll link to a couple in today's show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. This show was created by Joe Salcihai, produced by Richie Rutter reese and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I really thought doing these credits completely naked would have been a lot more fun than it actually was. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. Very quick after show. All right. Can I do uh, Rocket Man then? Yeah. Sounds good. Oh, I don't want to do Rocket Man. Okay. I have another one. Let's do this. I totally forgot. I wanted to talk about the fact that Cheryl for Father's Day took me a couple weeks ago to go see Dave Chappelle. How was that? It was so unbelievably good. It was so, so, so unbelievably good. What's amazing about him And I know, like, I'm not egotistical enough to think I'm the only person in this big theater to be watching, like, how he does it as much because of what we do, right? So so I'm watching his technique. I'm hoping to learn things, hoping to, because as we've talked about before openly, we try to study comedy. We used to get, well, we still from time to time get bad reviews about our comedy. And we learned that, hey, you can't just be some guy that, cracks a few jokes in his backyard and go start a podcast. You actually got to study this stuff a little bit. So I'm very much studying what Chappelle is doing. And you you already know the guy's a genius without even doing that, but just what he does. He's not so much a comedian as he is OG, a philosopher, right? I mean, really he's touching on every single hot button in America and he's making jokes that have a point on the end of all of them. And he's doing it in a way that even though he has a very wide audience, huge audience, he cracks jokes that no matter what your political, I mean, maybe there are people that are offended. I'm sure he offends lots of people, but he does it in a way that he grabs the biggest possible audience at the same time. Right. Comedian shows are just so underrated. They're just so underrated. Like I'm, everyone I've been to, I just, I got, this is the best thing to do today. Nick Offerman is coming to Dallas. Oh. I go see that guy in a heartbeat. I know. And I'm so upset. I'm going to be out of town during it. So I got my brother tickets because I'm a nice guy, but yeah, he seems really funny. Just his like deadpan. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Even my kids get it. Like we watched some parks and rec outtakes or whatever. There was a scene where, uh, where he's dating somebody and she asks him if he can move to Canada with him. Or if she she if he would move to Canada with her, and before he could even say anything, my oldest son goes, Pah! "Ron's not moving to Canada," <laughs> and like he spits out his coffee and he just starts laughing because you know that's exactly his like over the top response about being you know American or whatever the thing is, right? It's like yeah, you know. But uh, so so I'm just going to give you three quick things. First of all, if you've seen anything about the Chappelle reviews, it is real. They take your phone and they give you this pouch and they seal it. You cannot open the pouch. You are not allowed to take your phone out of this pouch. And they ask you ahead of time, is your phone on silent? 
and they hand you the pouch. And then on your way out, they have this, uh, this magnet that opens up your pouch and you can take it out. Mine was broken by the way. So I could actually take mine out, but I also knew that I get my butt kicked out if, if I took a picture, did anything. So I left it in the pouch. Cause I, I just wanted to see Chappelle and I really didn't need to, you know, tweet something right now that bad go to my Instagram. But the last thing is 10 minutes into Chappelle, you know, he's got this opening comedian stuff, 10 minutes into Chappelle right behind me. You know, that alarm your iPhone makes to wake you up in the morning. If you decide to set it on your, Hey Siri, set my alarm for six 30. Right. Well, you don't know that set my alarm for 10 30. That's what you said. Yeah. 10 15. Right. Yeah. Yep. That. Bah, 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 bah. Yeah. Def count four. Yes. See right fricking behind me. Bah, bah, bah. The person does nothing forever. I don't think they know it's them. And I actually thought it might be me. So I take my pouch and I put up to my ear, not me. Cheryl's looking at her person next to me. It's like everybody around me, you can see they're looking at them. It's the person right flipping behind me. Somehow they turn it off. I don't know how, but they somehow get it to stop. Maybe in that pouch, they finally found the side button. It goes off again a few minutes later. This time they have the amazing strategy of putting it under their butt and burying it in the seat. So hopefully you can't hear it. The damn thing went off the entire show. They didn't get up and go down. I, I mean, it would have taken four minutes to go down and ask the person at the front to turn off their alarm. So I got Chappelle in front of me and I've got an alarm going off right behind my head for the entire show. Thank you. Person. That's behind me. fun. Thank you That's fun. so much. Happy Father's Day. Yeah.